Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Podcast on Fifth Ave. And today is an exciting one because we have real live regular season hockey to talk about. The Penguins played and won against the Tampa Bay Lightning last night. So what what were some of our key impressions from from that game and the way that the Penguins showed up to play? Jenna, what what, what are you thinking right now? I mean, there were so many really good things from this team. It's hard to just kind of focus on one. I mean, the way they came out was a statement. I tweeted, you know, this was a statement start to the season for this team because there already weren't a lot of expectations for this team coming in. Obviously, we you know you have Malkin, you have Sidney Crosby, you have the core that they have, Chris Letang. You expect this team to do well, but I think a lot of people, especially after how they've exited the postseason in the last couple of years, have looked at this team as, Oh, yeah. they're on a downward trend. They're without Malkin. They're without Crosby to start. A lot of people didn't expect anything. And then it's, oh, you're coming into the defending Stanley Cup champs banner raising ceremony. Like they're playing in front of a pack house for the first time in a while. You expected kind of Tampa to really take over. I even said, you know, I kind of figured this game would be, you know, 3 2 Tampa till the end. They'd met an empty netter. And boy, was I incredibly wrong. <laughs> this was such a fun game to watch on so many levels. Not only terms of the guys that stepped up when you really needed to I tweeted I'm like if you had Dan Heinen and Brian Boyle scoring the first two goals of the NHL season on your bingo board congratulations good for you because my god that was impressive and you can talk all day too about the four check how they were limiting Tampa and Jari's play I mean there's so many there's so many things to talk about here there are a lot Taylor what were some of your takeaways yeah I mean going into that game I think a lot of people expected you know slaughter uh based on you know mm-hmm. just the, the guys the penguins were missing and you know just complete total domination and we saw that um just not the way that people expected i mean it was the other yeah. way around i know you know listening to uh lightning head coach john cooper talk after the game he tried he made it sound more like you know they just weren't ready um the line he gave was something it was like uh we could have played their farm team and we probably would have yeah. had the same result um, which isn't, you know, saying anything good about Wilkes Barre. They're just saying, you know, they should, they weren't that ready. But I, that's still underselling what Pittsburgh did. I mean, you look at, um, you know, just the defensive game and how just tight they were, and it was a complete game all around. And I think they only had like one giveaway, and like when mm-hmm. they, one total giveaway. When do you see that? They were just very responsible, reliable, um, and like Jenna said, you know, just contributions throughout the lineup. Mm-hmm. Some guys you wouldn't have predicted. And um, I mean, that's what they're going to need to get through this period until uh, they're healthy. Yeah. And with, without the contribution and play of Sidney Crosby and Malkin specifically, they, they do need consistency throughout the lines and they need that type of aggressive, annoying forecheck. Like you mentioned, Jenna, and that was what was incredible. They came last night and it was like they had already determined before the puck dropped this is our game and we're gonna win it i haven't seen them i don't think anybody has really watched them play and felt that good about the way they've looked or all that convinced that they were headed in the right direction in a in a long time and i just being able to to see them execute so well, not just with the forecheck, but with smart pass plays and actually bury the puck in the back of the net. They've had some really, really crappy puck luck in the past couple postseasons, and as a as a result, their their goaltending, their poor play in the net, kind of just uh, it, it was a recipe for disaster. But last night, it just felt like everything was a recipe for success and it was really dang fun to watch and it, i have said this quite a few times already but i'm far more excited now about the possibilities for this team this season than i was uh, 24 hours ago i was i like many people was not expecting a win last night and they did they did it and did it the right way is awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's really not a whole lot that you can complain about off of that game. If I had to pick, you know, one thing, it would really just be 
Um, I mean, so Tampa pulled their goalie with like a lot of time left for the extra attacker. And that that was just chaos. That was craziness. I mean, the Penguins scored three empty net goals um, of their own, which alone, again, crazy. A team hasn't scored more than two in a single game since 1984. It's only happened four times total, 1970. Uh, Blackhawks, 1981 Oilers, and the the 84 Red Wings. And it's different to go that long and the Penguins to do it. It's craziness. But then they also did allow two goals um, when Tampa had the extra attacker, which is not something you want to see. Um, but again, I, I think we only saw them practice um, a kind of six-on-five or five-on-six situation once during all of training camp. It's not really something that's, you know, a priority to start the season. And they, yeah. we, I don't – I think we ever really saw that whole lot in the preseason. It was a lot of opportunity. So um, they did say that that was something that they focused on in film before um, Wednesday's practice. So that that was something to take away from this. It's something they need to work on. But again, you're not going to run into too many situations where you have like over six minutes um, yeah. <laughs> where you have to play with six boards against six boards. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, that would have been my, my one knock. But again, it's not that, that huge of an issue. And just kind of with that, too, the way that they were able to respond, because usually you'll see a team give one up, then give two up. And it's, you know, a game. We had a game all of a sudden. It was 4-2. And then they went out and tallied that Mm -hmm. fifth goal. And it's like they continue to find that way, which isn't always the case from what we see from this team. Mm -hmm. And again, it's such a small sample size. I feel like I've been like trying to be like, all right, (laughs) like we have to pump the brakes a little bit because it is just one game. But to just play the way that they did and kind of like mm-hmm. you said, and Jordan, just to have a complete game in that way. I mean, yeah. that was a statement that was really impressive. And also, I mean, Tristan Jari looked really solid, like mm-hmm. really solid, especially, I mean, the first goal when you're watching it, the first goal that Tampa scored on the six on five was one of those. You're like, okay, that wasn't his fault. I don't even think the second goal really was anything. It wasn't something he could have done really anything mm-hmm. about you like to have seen him made a little bit more of a play, but also it's, you know, you're so handcuffed in those types of situations anyways. But he right. made those big saves when he needed to. And again, this is a Tampa Bay offense that's incredibly potent. They score mm-hmm. in flurries. They score fast. And they really can beat you with so many weapons that they have. And the Penguins and Jari neutralize those weapons in an unbelievable way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can't really uh, – you ha- what the, what this did for the morale of the team coming in, I mean, you can't ignore that. Um, you know, Dominic Simone talked after. He said it was an emotional win for them. Um, and he said, you know, it shows that we can play and, and keep up with teams like this because there were it was outside noise kind of doubting, you know, them uh, coming into this with all the – the, the injured guys that, and, or, un, like, not healthy guys coming into that game, it, it was over $30 million of their payroll. <laughs> it's like – I mean, that's insane. I, I did the math. It was, like, 34% of their total goals goal scored from last season uh, not in the game. Wow. Um, just from, from being injured or, or – or not healthy on, on the COVID list. So um, to have all those guys step up, um, I mean, we've seen it time and time again because it seems like the Penguins go through this every year, uh, usually not this early and with not this many key guys out. But um, yeah. to come in, just a, get a win this big against the defending mm-hmm. cup champions, spoil their banner night, um, and just a huge morale boost to start the season. And no matter what happens on the, in the second half of this Florida road trip, like it's already a win. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Seriously. The fact that they were able to snag a win in Tampa on banner raising night and historically teams don't always play the best on their own banner raising night. Like they, the record is somewhere around 500. I feel like I heard for the home team on opening night for the banner raising, but I, and I'm, this is not to discount the effort from the players because they all, the, the, the ferocity with which they played and the, the heart that they had last night was just incredible to watch. But I think that it, it speaks volumes even more to the kind of coach and the quality of coach that Mike Sullivan is, that he was able to rally his guys without so many key players on the night that had the implications that it did when every single person 
was saying basically, yeah, they're going to get destroyed. And on ESPN, no, like no less, I, he just completely outcoached John Cooper. And we can, we can get into key standout players in the next segment, but Oh my God, Mike Sullivan really, he blew me away last night. And yeah, John Cooper can say whatever he wants about the AHL affiliate of our team, but he, he could not, he didn't hold a candle to Mike Sullivan last night. And that was very evident, especially pulling the goalie with six and a half minutes left. That was wild. Yeah. John Cooper even said after, like he wished he would have done it earlier. Just I don't know, craziness. And Sullivan, he did with that, with that win tie Balsma for most all time by a coach in, in Penguins franchise history. So very fitting. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, John Cooper said he wished he would have pulled the, the goalie earlier. You no know, Penguins management is not happy with that comment that he made about the farm team. Um, I don't Can't know if that's imagine. getting defensive about Wilkes-Barre. Like no one talks about the kids that way. Um, but, no. um, they, not they our were, time. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, they didn't like that comment. No. Well, they shouldn't. It was a low blow and totally unwarranted for the type of game that the Penguins play. They just, yeah, they, they were the better team. And that is the first time that I've thought that about the Penguins in a, in a composed way. Um, why don't we take a quick break? And then when we come back, we can talk a little bit more specifically about players that uh, sit out test their performances. So we'll be right back. We are back. So we mentioned already that it was a very full roster effort last night, but there definitely were a handful of guys who I feel made a bigger and better impression than some. So Taylor, who are a couple of players from last night that really stood out to you in terms of how they played? Honestly, the one who stood out the most, um, at least in the first period and really just had a good game all game, um, isn't someone who showed up on the, on the score sheet, but it was Mark Friedman. Um, Mark Friedman had a great game on defense. He wasn't even supposed to be in the game um, based off the morning skate. Uh, he was the extra defenseman. Um, he only got into the lineup because Mike Matheson wasn't ready mm-hmm. to go. They had told him before Tuesday, uh, Tuesday's morning skate, you know, to stay ready because they weren't sure about Mike Matheson. Um, and then so he got in. He was playing on the left side. He is a natural righty. Um, and just the aggressiveness with which he plays and the um, just the off- the plays he was making offensively. I mean, he, he you know, set up a two-on-one um, with Dominic Simone. Um, Dominic Simone didn't score off of that one. Um, but it was a great opportunity. And then there was also one um, – in the, I think it was in the third period when the puck popped out to him in the slot and he moved forward and, you know, joined the play and had a mm-hmm. uh, great scoring chance. And he said in situations like those, he thinks it helps to being on his offside because as a righty on the left side, then his stick is always facing the middle and in the scoring lane rather than, you know, on the boards. And um, he just had a great game. And, uh, you know, Matheson is probably also going to be out there that he didn't practice Wednesday. They called up P.O. Joseph from, from Wolfsbury, who is a natural lefty, but I think P.O. is just going to be more so insurance because mm-hmm. you, you can't I, – I, I couldn't argue taking out Friedman. And even his pairing with Ruidil, um, if yeah. you look at, like, the advanced stats after, as far as, like, shot attempts for and against, like, no pairing was more effective than the friedman Ruidel pairing, which – um, I don't think anyone would have going into this. A Freeman Ruido pairing would have had, you know, the best you mm-hmm. know, day out of all the defensemen. So um, those guys would be my my under the radar standouts. Mm. Jenna, what about you? I think I'll go a little more above the radar because Taylor, you mentioned Brian or Brian Boyle. Obviously, I think he mm-hmm. had a really fantastic game, especially kind of after some of the question marks we saw from training camp. But to me. Dom Simone had himself a game, obviously scoring what ended up being the game winning goal, Mm -hmm. but I just cannot get the, what he did in the first period, the pass that he had to Brock McGinn, who went in one-on-one against Vasilevsky, obviously didn't capitalize on it, but that play to me 
stood out to show this is what he can do. This is what th- I'm pretty sure that was him, right? As I'm going off on this being like, yes, this is what he did. <laughs> Um, but he, I'm like diving straight in being like, that absolutely was him, but that was it. Um, yes. Yeah. It just, you know, he looked really confident out there. He looked really comfortable out there. And he was a guy that I think a lot of people were saying needed to step up in a game mm-hmm. like this. I mean, obviously you needed everybody to step up, but especially those secondary guys. And another one that I feel like we've talked about a lot the last couple of weeks here, Evan Rodriguez made some really solid Mm -hmm. plays. I think he had a similar situation where he had this like really nice move along the boards. I forget who he passed it to, who kind of had a wide open shot in front of the net. Um, He was making plays out there. He was looking confident. He was really finding his footing. And it was impressive what he was able to mm-hmm. do. I, I, I He was one of those guys that you could see when he was on the ice, he made an impact and not, you know, that isn't entirely, he doesn't seem to sustain that a lot. So to see him do that yesterday, I think is a good building block for him as well. And of the three empty yeah. netters, I mean, as impressive as an empty netter can be, I mean, his was from like the complete opposite end of the ice. So like, um, that was just beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I mean, really it wasn't was an empty great. net goal, but uh, it was a very good empty net goal for mm-hmm. that Rodriguez. Right on target. My God. Yeah. Yeah. So my my picks, I'll go, I'll start with the obvious and then move a little bit further back. We already mentioned Tristan Jari, but I, he needs yeah. to be talked about again. And it wasn't just that he played well. He He looked mentally sharp and that – that was something that was very hit or miss for him last year. He would, he would look like a, a lost puppy sometimes in the crease, just like very uh, shaky and d- like doubting his ability a lot. It looked like, and that was where we saw those really egregious mistakes, uh, especially in the in the series against New York, but. He did give up two goals, and Jenna, you you said that they weren't really ah, what, what, not much he could do there. And it's worth noting that they only scored those two goals with the extra attacker on the ice, so they could not score even strength on Tristan Jari last night. And he he just looked really in shape and looked it, it, his glove hand was tops. He it, I just feel like he he was playing with a confidence that he regained somewhere along the way in the off season, and that's super exciting. Some not so on the radar. I, I honestly was pretty impressed by Sam Lafferty. He didn't really do anything crazy incredible, but he talk about good passes that that set up to Brian Boyle, just that little bloop saucer pass that he just dumped it right where it needed to be on the stick of Brian Boyle and and the net it went and he just he played a really solid 200 foot game and he hasn't done much in the past to really warrant him being in the lineup but he stepped up in a major way last night I was I was impressed with him and I think I saw that he was one he was one of the only guys without a point, but it didn't really matter because he, he, he was aggressive. He was playing smart and John Marino was also playing very smart. I feel like we saw some flashes of the rookie John Marino that everybody was so freaking excited about. Um, And I, I think having him on that middle pairing is just going to be, Oh my gosh, our our blue line right now is the the talent and potential is through the roof. And I, I, yeah, I love John Marino, and it was nice to see a really good game out of him. So those would be my my three there for the standouts. But yeah, Tristan Jari above the rest. He he played a really good game. Brock McGinn was strong too. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a couple of, of he led in hits and block shots. Um, I think four hits and three block shots. I might have that reverse, but it was the most uh, either way for in neither set on um, on the team. Just big on the PK, but yeah, the the block shots he had were huge too. So he is someone that stood mm-hmm. out too. The, the bottom six. I mean, a lot of guys stepped up. Yeah, yeah. I also really enjoyed all the block McGinn tweets. I was like, this is really, <laughs> really proud of everybody uh... for them. So clever. You gotta love it. 
know. Yeah. And Jordan, with what you were saying about Tristan and Jari too, I mean, we remember the, how he started the season last year. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was so shaky. And obviously, everybody points to the playoffs, but he gave up, what, uh, nine goals in the first two games before he was pulled? Oof. Yeah, it wasn't that good. Right? Am I doing math right? Sounds, sounds, right. Sounds, <laughs> sounds accurate. Yeah, something along, something close to double digit goals. And mm-hmm. then obviously we remember, you know, he kind of stepped back a little bit. They talked about, you know, how he did some things mentally for his game. Mm-hmm. And I think this was a huge point of confidence for him to kind of come back and say, hey, I'm putting what happened in the postseason against the Islanders behind me. We're moving mm-hmm. forward. We're going to get back to the routine that these guys get to. But also, again, the fact that they're playing that full 82 game season again, he's going to get. You know, I think a lot of people hope he gets back to the all-star season he yeah. had before the pandemic. And he kind of showed so many flashes of that last night to mm-hmm. say, hey, I can, you know, come back in. I can put a shaky postseason performance behind me. I can come out with confidence. And I think it spoke volumes about the entire team playing around each other. And again, the fact that the four check was able to limit those chances. So Jari didn't mm-hmm. have too much. It was that very, it was a very big balance in general Mm -hmm. it was a beautiful balancing game very fine line but they towed it masterfully last night they really did and yeah I think that if we had seen the Tristan Jari of last season whenever Tampa did finally get chances around the net he probably would have let up a weak goal. So why don't we take another break and then come back and talk about Big Jeff Carter and uh, airplane snacks and travel. Recording now. All right, we're back. So all signs are pointing to Jake Gensel returning to the lineup tomorrow night and coming off the heels of a really dominant performance. The question is, who who do you take out of the lineup to put Jake back in? And then how do the how are the lines going to start to take shape and hold with with this new face? We're only one game in. I'm mm-hmm. talking like we're, we're having to restructure the entire foundation of the team. But it's still, like, coming off of a win like that, it's like, okay, so a lot of guys prove their worth. So, Jenna, how do you see the lineup looking tomorrow night with the very imminent return of Jake Gensel? I think you're obviously going to have to shake – some things up, no doubt about it. It's going to be interesting. I I wonder, especially with some of these guys coming back from COVID. I mean, the good thing from all the reports that we'd heard from Jake as well, saying that he was asymptomatic, which is one of the reasons why he's reportedly allowed Mm -hmm. to get back so quickly because of the protocols and stuff like that. But you do wonder if they're going to limit his time, how much they're going to limit his time, or if they're just going to kind of, you know, say, Hey, we know what you can do. We know where your levels are at. Obviously, I feel like this is more of just like an outsider's take versus, you know, them being in the locker room consistently. I mean, they know mm-hmm. how to manage. It's not a question of that at all. Yeah. I'm just going to be intrigued to see since he wasn't on the ice for 10 days, especially ramping up. Or actually, was it the full 10 days? No. He, yeah. So he didn't have to go through the full 10 day isolation period. That's only if you're symptomatic. That's um, right. If a player isn't symptomatic he just needs two negative tests um Mm. uh a day apart so he gensel tested positive on october 3rd it's currently october 13th so he's only been skating i think three days now and that's not all full practices so he's been on the ice a little bit but that still was you know almost a full week um, yeah so I do wonder how much that is going to kind of play into things and how much of a factor that's going to be. I also had to chuckle a little bit. I'm going a little off tangent here, just as what he was saying, you know, how he kept busy during COVID, the 1,000 piece puzzle, which I concur because I did that during my (laughs) isolation period. It works wonders, let me tell you. You just get so locked in and next thing you know, it's 4 a.m. and you're like, I need to go to bed. I was just doing that. (laughs) stuck on this puzzle um so yeah that definitely uh definitely helped uh with the uh passing of the time Mm -hmm. but just going back to you know what we were saying before move in the lineup how you adjust things i mean 
obviously I think you have to put him back on the top line. Although I do wonder again, how they manage minutes, how that kind of goes. I feel like maybe O'Connor's a guy that you move, but then at the same time, like he has been playing so well, but again, it's very hard to just kind of look at who didn't play well the other night and say, who do you move? But obviously when you have a guy like Gensel coming back in the lineup, you're not going to say, eh, we're going to wait on him. Yeah, back to what, what Gensel did kill time during during quarantine. Yeah, we talked to Russ the other day after practice, and you know, someone asked him, you know, like, have you talked to Gensel? Well, you know, what's his mood like? And he said, you know, he's doing fine. It just sounds like he's really bored because, um, you know, he couldn't be Gensel couldn't be around his wife. Like, I, they were oh they had to like live separate during this period because um, I guess she didn't have it. Um, but yeah, no, like I asked, I asked Gensel after, after practice Wednesday, like, you know, like we heard you're getting bored, like what you're doing, what were you doing to kill the time? And yeah, he said a thousand piece puzzle and he was reading some sports books and I was like, what kind of sports books are you reading? And he said he read a whole biography on Tiger Woods, um, and just how, you know, he wow. grew up and other stuff like that. Um, but he, he was still able to work out during this period because, I mean, he, he wasn't feeling any symptoms and he did have mm -hmm. a Peloton bike at home. So he, he was on the Peloton um, doing what he could. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but as far as lines, I mean, from Wednesday, we did see him, um, you know, taking line rushes. He was on the first line with Carter and Russ, for, which is where we kind of expected him. Mm -hmm. um, Dayton Heinen was the guy that was there on the opener. Dayton Heinen moved down to the third line. Um, with Bluger and McGinn, which is where we kind of saw Heinen during the preseason when mm. everyone was healthy. And then uh, Dominic Simone, who was on the third line, did get shifted down to the fourth line with Boyle and Lafferty. So O'Connor was the odd guy out. And I, when I tweeted the lines, a lot of people were kind of uh, getting mad that it was O'Connor, the guy coming out. You know, he's a young guy. And because going into this, you know, based off of, you know, the camps and preseasons everyone had, I think Lafferty would have been, you know, the weak link of that line who we would have expected to come out. But, uh, I mean, watching Lafferty in, in the preseason game and, you know, like the pass he made to Boyle, I, I don't know how you could, you know, take him out of the lineup after that. So that looks like, you know, that's how the lines are going to shake out. And then the fourth line is going to be, you know, uh, Lafferty and Simone on, on Boyle's wings. Um, yeah, all signs are pointing towards Gensel plays uh, Thursday just because he was taking those line rushes. O'Connor didn't participate in a single line rush. And then um, when they moved on to the uh, power play, Gensel was on the top unit and for the entire duration of the special teams work. And that's usually the one thing that tells you that a guy is going to come back. I did ask Sullivan mm -hmm. if he's going to be available, and he didn't have give a real answer. Um, so, uh, which, again, not that surprising. Um, but yeah, Gensel looks like he's going back on the top power play unit. Then Zucker was moved down to the awesome. second unit. So, um, yeah, not not a ton of changes. Um, and again, mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting to see how those play out because the lineup without Gensel did so well. Mm -hmm. They did. And what you really kind of have to take into consideration is they're going to – they're whoever they do take out of the lineup is going to be – uh, it's going to be unfortunate that they're removed, but at the same time, a player of Gensel's caliber, you know, that you're getting, you could replace anybody in the lineup with him and you would be upgrading because he's just that kind of player. So it's, it's only exciting that he's coming back. And I, I'm really hopeful that he's able to play tomorrow night. Yeah. And again, O'Connor, he did have a good camp too. And he's mm -hmm. someone that is young and, you know, if they do want to send him down and get him some playing time in Wilkes-Barre, mm -hmm. Wilkes-Barre opens the season um, Saturday. Um, he can come back up. I think we're still going to see O'Connor again. I think this is, yeah. doesn't mean that O'Connor is gone. Um, but I mean, for now, it just looks like, I, I don't think Lafferty is a guy we're going to be seeing for the full season either, just based off of the sample size we do have of, of his, you know, he, he does have some deficiencies. And I think, you know, the first time he takes a, a bad penalty or two in a game, I think, you know, he's coming out. O'Connor's going back in if there is an opening for O'Connor. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's going to be a fluid situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but outside of that, there there was some other uh, movement with the Penguins in that uh, Jeff Carter was <laughs> really hauling tons and tons and tons of Welch's fruit snacks and i saw taylor that you were you were trying to get him a 
a sponsorship of some kind with Welch's? Have they have they gotten back to you on that yet? No, honestly, I don't know how active the Welch's Twitter account is. But yeah, for people that don't know, it, Monday when the Penguins were flying um, to Florida, you know, they always post the pictures of guys in their suits. I feel like we see Captain a picture of him at least every game just because he goes all out. But one of the pictures they posted was like Jeff Carter getting on the plane and he's holding like a, like, like a gas station or a grocery store bag. And you can see through it. And like one of the things in the, the main things in the bag, um, is just a giant bag of fruit snacks, <laughs> like it's like a family size, <laughs> just industrial size bag of fruit snacks. Um, so I, I did, I tweeted, like, I, I, I zoomed in on it and I, I quote tweeted it with that. And I was like, that's a lot of fruit snacks. Um, and his wife quote tweeted it too. She actually tagged Welch's first, but you know, she said like, it's my favorite tweet. <laughs> so I think she's trying to get the sponsorship deal, but, um, I don't know, but then he scored, uh, well, he didn't score, but he set up the Heinen, um, the Heinen goal, mm -hmm. uh, in Tuesday and he was an important star. So I did at Welch and I was like, you know, this guy eats number you know, star. a ton of fruit snacks and then goes out <laughs> and gets number one star. I think you should be calling him. But no, I, then I did or walking out of the interview room, get, like we didn't talk to Carter as like a, a scrum yes, uh, on Tuesday, but as we were walking into the media room, um, we kind of crossed paths and uh, I saw him and like, I just talking to him for a little bit. And I was like, did you get all those fruit snacks on the plane? Um, and he's like, yeah, within the first five minutes, I ate that whole bag. And again, if you look at the, the bag of fruit snacks in question, um, massive bag of fruit snacks. Can't believe we're talking about the fruit snacks when that, first came out someone tweeted at me and was like are you guys gonna be talking about the fruit snacks on the podcast and it's like we're not, why are we talking about the fruit snacks on the podcast but um the legend grows so um they had to, had to come up but um, oh my god yeah. yeah i think you need did you tweet at welch's fruit snacks because they have their own account and I'm doing some quick research here. Joe Mixon from the Bengals was tweeting at them, and they're going to send them his way because he wants to, quote, flood his car and house in fruit snacks. Oh All God. right, we're making this happen. This, it's a new I, I think we campaign. need to get Welch's fruit snacks on the train because I, I think this is like a match made in heaven. Oh this my gosh, you're absolutely seriously. right. No, I, I added the Welch's account. So what, the jelly people are seeing this? It's all the same people. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. We need to get a little more specific, though. The Although fruit they snacks did, people need to know. They did do the red oh flag God. tweet. I've never had Welch's fruit snacks. <laughs> so we're uh, oh thinking for that as well. Honestly, I haven't had real Love fruit it. snacks in forever, but I do eat melatonin gummies at night. Like they are fruit mm. snacks, and I'm just like, yep. uh, I'm I'm gone. <laughs> yep. Yeah, all my vitamins are gummies. Yep, mm -hmm. yep, yeah. It's adulting, everybody. You think it's like you have to take these pills? No, no, no. We go back to childhood. Make it fun. Fruit snacks. Make it fun. Yeah. There's yeah. no reason it should be boring and you should choke on a pill you know, <laughs> I, for the sake of being healthy. No. When, when I tweeted, like, the picture of Carter and the fruit snacks, like, there were a couple of replies, like, they're like, this is a peak dad move. And I was like, is it a peak dad move to eat that many fruit snacks yourself? Or, like, what is the dad move that, like, he's bringing them along and it's like, I don't know, when the young guys on the team start acting up, he passes out the fruit snacks. Like, when John Marino... <laughs> know uh the card game or the video game or whatever they do starts getting too loud then like he has out the fruit snacks but um oh i don't gosh. know would love to know it goes down on the plane with the fruit snacks um but i guess uh, does he that's... share are like the berries his favorite what about the cherries like i think this is information people need to know <laughs> yeah we need to find out so... i mean at Whenever we get these kind of like boarding the plane shots now from the team, I'm going to be looking like, okay, mm -hmm. does Jeff Carter have his fruit snacks? What kind of game is it going to be? Because yeah. that's the fuel. Yeah. <laughs> also, yeah. just one little aside. We didn't talk about his play that set up the first goal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that was, that was un, like I mean, everybody on Twitter yeah. was basically like, did Vasilevsky expect Jeff Carter to knock that puck down? Because I don't think he did. And I don't mm -hmm. think Plus you did. No, and then yeah, That's setting amazing. the hind up from below the goal line, like I, I don't know. We see Sid do that all the time. Um, so good to see that you know Carter can step up and fill that role even in Sid's absence uh, on the first line, being able to make those plays from below the goal line. Yeah, he's a real all star, and we need to get him the sponsorship ASAP. <laughs> so 
everybody, if you could join us in that campaign, we'll find a hashtag that's super clever to get Welch's on board. But uh, yeah, as always, thank you so much for listening to another episode of a podcast on Fifth Dad. We'll see you next week. <laughs>